my pleasure to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show. Our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. One of the big areas we focus on at our company is helping you with your monthlies. What are monthlies? They're discretionary items that you pay for every month. Think about uh, your mortgage payments, not really one, because that's not discretionary. You got that. But you've got uh, TV, streaming services, movies, cell phones, blah, blah, blah. You think of all the things, health clubs. And I got great news for you. If you've been afraid to go to a little-known brand for your cell phone service, there's new data that says, believe it or not, there are some discounters that offer much higher customer satisfaction than the big three, AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile. And later, how about people earning a good living from thrifting? you got to have an eye for fashion. We'll talk about that. So cell phone service is a big monthly expense for so many people, and there's been this uh, big divide going on between the big three and everybody else. The prices are spreading apart like the Nile or the Red Sea or whatever parting. I mean, man, the prices are spreading. And so the big three are trying to push people into higher price plans or they're using a battering ram like Verizon. They say, yeah, yeah, you're on that plan, but now we're going to charge you more for it. And a whole bunch of other people with Verizon are about to have a nice surprise coming in their next monthly bill that Verizon bumped up your rate yet again because the cell phone carriers know this, and particularly AT&T and Verizon, which both have their tradition in traditional home phone service, they knew that there were people that were disconnecting home phones regularly for years and years and years. And then there were the uh, uh, super loyalists who were going to keep that home phone line. And so they kept pushing those prices up, 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 and up, boosting profits even as their overall number of customers declined. So that playbook worked for them before, and now they're doing it again. And so I want you to be solidly aware. And J.D. Power's new um, survey of the best customer service for cell phones shows that two of, let's call them the off-brands, have much, 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 much higher customer satisfaction than the big three brand names. In fact, it's not even close. Who came out head and shoulders above every other cell phone carrier company called Mint Mobile. You see them advertise very heavily on TV and cycles, and their customer satisfaction off the charts. And the company that usually in so many surveys ranks number one was just a whisker behind them, Consumer Cellular. Consumer Cellular has been a crowd pleaser for a long time, and I think about the complaints we'll get to Clark Stinks. Why don't I talk about Consumer Cellular? Why don't I talk about it? It's so great. Well, here I am mentioning it again. And these two, okay, so Met Mobile's score is an 862. You know, J.D. Power has its methodology. Consumer Cellular, 857. So where are we with, how about Verizon? 748. Not even in the same universe. AT&T, 753. T-Mobile, the highest customer satisfaction of the big three behemoths, 803. Now, see, so you know, the reason you may not be willing to switch is you worry about customer service, you worry about network and all that. Obviously, people are exceedingly happy with Mint and with Consumer Cellular. And they are both so much cheaper than what you have to pay any of the big three. So check them out. Mint does a lot of deals where you can try them for a while, and if you like it, you then pay for a year. You commit to a year 
at a time, and then your effective cost is usually a third to a fourth per month what it is with one of the big guys. So you could do the trial period, see what you think. You don't like it. You can always go back and pay the behemoths too much money, or you could just save money. Were you going to say, Chris? Oh, I was just going to say we have guides to, we're on top of this with the cell phone thing, saving people money, like you said in the, at the top. And so we're constantly updating our articles on all the brands and what deals they have at Clark.com. So. And so we, when we write about the, um, the minor companies, let's call them minor companies, because when you, when I watch football, football season's over. It's very depressing. Anyway, during football, it used to be beer commercial, beer commercial, beer commercial, followed by car commercial, car commercial, car commercial. Now it's Verizon, AT&T, and to a lesser extent, T-Mobile. One after another, after another, after another. Um, because they are marketing machines. They're not necessarily price-oriented machines or um certainly not customer service machines. So that's why we put so much effort at Clark.com into telling you about these. And we always kind of talk about these discounters tentatively because people tend to grade a lower price more harshly than they do a higher price provider. But uh, the truth is, at least these two lower price providers are putting a big smile on people's faces and their wallets. All right, we'll go to questions. This is from Wes in Connecticut. He says, I use my Amex Gold card for restaurant and grocery store purchases and earn four times rewards, and I transfer them to Delta Sky Miles. For everyday purchases, I've been going back and forth with my city double cash card and my Freedom Unlimited. I take reward points and deposit them as cash back into an online savings account with Marcus that is currently at 3.75%. and 3 .75%. I also have a Fidelity Go account, along with my Fidelity IRA, both opened under your guidance, and have a Fidelity Signature Rewards card. 2% cash back on everything. For long-term savings, do you think I should continue to do what I've been doing with my cash back cards and depositing into online savings, or start using my Fidelity card and deposit into a Fidelity account? I will continue to fund my online savings as an emergency fund either way. And FYI, I'm 52 and own my business. I just bought the business three years ago and only recently started putting money into savings and retirement. I don't have much saved yet, but I now have an opportunity to put quite a bit away. Well, first of all, congratulations to you on every score. And the way you're playing the credit card game, fantastic. So you're asking me, should I do this great thing with putting money into savings and earning a decent rate on the savings? Or should I do this other great thing and put money aside for retirement. And I'd say that you should tilt towards the retirement thing. You're already, as you said, someone who is conscientious about putting money into savings. So I want you to emphasize, being uh, 52, that your goal needs to be that you just pound money into retirement accounts. You know, the Roth accounts, you're earning tax-free, you spend tax-free, that is the highest priority. And you haven't said with your business, if you're a single employee entity or you have employees, there are wonderful retirement accounts for you in either circumstance where you can pump up your retirement savings. If you are a single employee entity, you can do a self-employed 401k with Fidelity, since you're already there, and you could put enormous amounts of money into an account with them to catch up on that retirement savings. And so that's a, a great way. Otherwise, if you have employees, you could set up a SEP where they would benefit and you would benefit from saving for the future. That's an SEP IRA. This is from Bill in Ohio. I caught Sam's Club adding a dollar to certain items that are supposed to ship for free for PLUS members. Is this illegal as I already pay a higher fee for the PLUS membership? Illegal. Okay. So, Bill, um, I did this as a consumer alert uh, months ago when I noticed that Sam's was starting to do discriminatory pricing. And the way you can see if they're cheating PLUS members, and this to me clearly is cheating PLUS members, because the way the PLUS membership was sold was that you could buy things online or pick them up in the store, online for uh, shipping or in the store, and the shipping was free as a PLUS member. Well, it's not free if they're charging a higher price for the item. 
So what I do when I'm at Sam's Club's website, and this just came up recently where there was a price difference, in the, the case of the item I was looking at, I think it was $3, is you click on pickup and it'll show you the price as it would be in the store. And then you click on shipping and it'll show you the higher price they may be charging for that item. And I can't figure out the pattern because um, many or most items for a Plus member are the same price shipping or pickup. But there are uh, quite a few items that they are charging this higher price, even though shipping is supposed to be free. So it, is, um, it breaks trust with members that Sam's is doing it. You shouldn't offer it as a benefit with being a Plus member and then turn around and sneakily charge more when you put it in your cart for shipping. And what I love about you asking about this is it brings a light to a bad practice from their parent company, from Walmart. This should not be happening. This is from John in South Carolina. What is your opinion on UMA phone service? UMA is awesome. UMA is something I used to have questions about constantly, but so many people no longer depend on a traditional or semi-traditional phone service. But if you have a need or a want, it runs over your home or business internet connection. And UMA is extraordinary. It's very affordable for phone service. It works extremely well. Um, we never hear complaints about UMA. Uh, in fact, the only complaint we ever had was that the call quality wasn't good. And that would typically be because your internet connection is unreliable at your home or business. But UMA, if you have a need to have more like traditional phone service for your home or your business, UMA will save you a ton. And I can recommend it highly. So coming up ahead, we're going to talk about shopping a whole different way and how the shopping could earn you a living. Several years ago, I sold an investment property. It was a rental property. And I remember talking to the buyer at the closing, and it came up what she does for a living. She had been in a traditional corporate job, and she had a little side thing, buying stuff at thrift stores, finding things available for sale on eBay and things like that. And then she would resell them. And her primary outlet was something called Poshmark, I think is what it's called. And she was having a great time earning a much better living. She had majored in college in fashion design. And she really understood the quality of a garment and the perceived value of it in the market. And so that's how, at least at that point, don't know what she's doing today, but that's how she was earning a really good living that allowed her to qualify as a woman in her 20s to buy her own home. And she's not the only one. I remember when I first told this story about her years ago, having person after person saying, hey, well, I do this uh buying things on eBay, and then I uh, fix them up or sell them different kinds of items. Electronics is a category a lot of people do well with. I know a guy who um, buys beat-up cell phones, reconditions them, and then earns a really good living selling them back into the marketplace. There is so much opportunity today, this combination of in-person, online, the ability to find the needle in a haystack and turn it into value for you is just great. Now, you don't do this stuff tax-free. I mean, if you're running a business, you're going to pay taxes on your net profit like any other business that somebody's running. And I love it when you have a special skill, experience, or interest where you're able to see value and create value where others don't see it, and you're able to make money from it, how great is that? And you think about clothing. 
you know, the clothing market is uh, really a crazy one for women's fashion. Because as a guy, I mean, <laughs> most guys are like me. They wear something till basically it can become a kitchen rag. And like I'm wearing the shorts I'm wearing today, they're uh, khaki shorts. And look at these, Krista. These are, they're really getting worn out, like discolored over here and all that. Um, but I'm not going to replace them because they aren't at rag stage yet. And I got a lot of years out of them. Do I embarrass you? Being in my presence about of how I dress. Of course not. I would never, ever feel that way. <laughs> well, but women's Your cargo fresh. shorts are, you know, in now. My son went to a thrift store and bought cargo pants. So what's, you know, what's old is new again. So, and his are totally beat up, the ones that he bought. Oh, so wearing your, beat up ones is actually becoming in? Yeah, you're It's like women with the jeans that they buy them for twice the money because they have a tear by the manufacturer on purpose yeah. uh -huh. at the knee or whatever. Okay, I don't understand that. I don't understand it. But women's fashion creates such a great market opportunity if you have skill in that area because the um, there's so much surplus women's clothing. So much women's clothing is disposed of when it's still in perfect condition because, uh, as you mentioned, fashion will change, Krista, or it, uh, maybe somebody's size changes, or they just don't like it. And so there's this gigantic inventory of used women's clothing that, for people that are skilled, can earn money at it. And there are so many things like that where the knowledge, the experience, the interest you have, the hobbies you've been involved in can end up being a really nice source of income as a part-time side thing or as what you do as your thing. Krista? Okay, Jacob in Pennsylvania. Thank you for being nice about my worn-out shorts, by the way. Jacob in Pennsylvania says, thanks for your advice the other day on interest rates and savings accounts. I called Fidelity today to confirm the yield on my cash reserves, and you were spot on. I'll be moving my savings account from my community bank, earning 0.15% to the cash reserves as soon as possible. Okay, so wait, I want you to think about the difference here. 0.15. All right, so that's 15 times what the giant monster mega banks are paying on savings, and it's still 15 one hundredths of 1% goes to Fidelity, he's earning right now four point something percent. Yep. And here's the kicker. As a college student, I want to avoid signing up for too many paid subscriptions while I'm still in school. Unfortunately, my Google Cloud is running out of storage and it seems like I will need to change how I back up my photos. Any advice on where to find free or one-time purchase cloud space that I can use to back up my photos? my photos. So there's a lot, if you look at the technology blogs and you search this, you'll find a lot of uh, articles that have been written about what people should do who uh, were spoiled by the Google unlimited storage of photos that ended. So your older photos are all grandfathered in, but your newer ones, uh, you have the, the cap on storage. And then usually what Google's charging is works out to be $24 a year for excess storage uh, photos. Uh, that may not be nearly enough for you because you may be one of the people who takes 4,000 photos every single day. Um, if you have a college student Amazon Prime membership, then you have free photo storage from Amazon that nobody uses, as best I can tell, but that would be a way that you can offload all your pictures and do it for free. The suggestion we had last time this came up from several people was about storing on your own hard drive, but that is not nearly as convenient as what you might want on the go. It might work for you, but you might want the convenience of having your photos available to you at all times. And using one of the other storage kind of things that are usually for big data files won't necessarily save you money over Google's typical $24 a year to store photos. And then a lot of sites will give you um, for free a certain amount, like Dropbox is one that gives you two gigs of storage, and then you have to pay beyond that. So you could cobble something together as well. But then you'd have to really work it where you get 
uh, you put these photos in this storage and you put these other photos in this other storage. And uh, that's probably more than most of us are ever going to want to do. Stephen in Oregon says, I just finished reading your article on junk mail. I didn't notice any reference to the mail that charity organizations send. But every week I get numerous mail requests from both those I've given to in the past and those that I haven't. This seems like a great waste of money. Any way to stop it? I wish there was. I mean, you do the mail preference service and you're going to find that uh, most charities are not going to leave you alone. They, uh, they tend to operate in their own orbit separate because I've talked about how you have the ability to stop so much junk mail with the mail preference service. But the, the equivalent is not really there for charities. And when my late mom got into this uh, thing with the fake charities soliciting her all the time, she would get literally hundreds of pieces of mail a month from charities and fake charities soliciting from her. And it is a, a huge waste of money and trees and all the rest. And I'm going to think this through and see if anything new is out there, there would be a good way for you to stop the charitable solicitations. I haven't seen it, haven't heard of it, but I'll look around and see if there is something. And if there is, I will talk about it here on the podcast and update your question. Carrie in Wisconsin says, my credit is really messed up. My ex and his side chick did a number unbeknownst to me. Side chick? I'm that's, work a, that's an expression I haven't heard before. Got it. Okay. I'm working Other, diligently right. to get my life back on track. Do you recommend freezing credit with the three big big three bureaus as well as the smaller ones such as LexisNexis, SageStream, CoreLogic, and Innovis? Will it hurt or help, and is it worth the effort? First of all, it's worth the effort. I don't know the layers of deception that went on with your ex and the side chick. And if they did things that were bad before, they may well engage in the activities again. So at the very least, freezing your credit files with the three major credit bureaus is a great thing. Now, you are not responsible for credit obtained under fraudulent circumstances, but you're held to a higher standard when it is a family member or potentially a friend. And so with family member with uh, fraud against credit, you have to be willing to go all the way to filing a police report against the alleged guilty parties. And that's something that is required by the credit granters and by the credit bureaus that you're not just talking, trying to pretend a family member, in this case your ex, did nasty things pretending to be you and getting credit as if they're you. Now, if it was using credit that you had already established and that, uh, let's say, your ex was an authorized user, you don't have protections against that. Um, and that is an area that causes a lot of heartache in the wallet and reputation for so many people. But if it was establishing new credit falsely, then use the law as your friend if you're comfortable doing that. And I'm really sorry all that happened to you. So as you went into mentioning all the minor credit bureaus, yes, you can go through the process with them. It's not as easy as it is with the three majors, Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian, but they all have different roles to play. And it's certainly in a case where there's been active identity theft, friendly fire, well, whatever we call it, family fire, uh, I think it's worth it to take the additional steps for peace of mind. What it means is that when you need to apply for credit or whatever it is that that bureau oversees, you have to temporarily thaw that file, but that is completely free to freeze and to thaw. And I'm really sorry that all that happened to you. And I hope that your life moving forward, you're able to heal the emotional wounds and the financial wounds you've suffered as well. Uh, thank you for tuning in to today's podcast. I want you to know when you have a question, when you have a problem, you have a difficult situation, know that we are here to serve you for free with one-on-one -on -one guidance, advice, and information at our Team Clark Consumer Action Center. You can see how to reach us 
30 hours each week by going to clark.com slash CAC.